Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Mark Rendell. You may remember me from stupidity last night. Uh, there may be more stupidity in the last talk of the day, which we're back in here, um, where we talk about some really, really bad mistakes that people have made in programming. But this is my sensible talk. They make me do a sensible talk as well. So this is about writing code that writes code with Roslyn. And uh, we'll look at how Roslyn works, what the different bits of it are, and then at the end I'll show you how to do something actually useful with it and create an analyzer and code fix that works inside Visual Studio. So Roslyn, basically it's, it's where those red squiggles and green squiggles under your code come from. It's a lot more than that. It's, it's the thing that compiles C-sharp code into MSIL and then that gets passed on to the JIT that turns it into native code. But when Microsoft rewrote the C-sharp compiler for C-sharp 6, before that it had been written in C++. And one of the sort of key milestones for any programming language is that the compiler for the language should be written in the language. And so with C Sharp 6, Microsoft said, we're going to rewrite the C Sharp compiler in C Sharp. Um, and the VB.NET team said, we're going to rewrite the VB.NET compiler in VB.NET, which serves them right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yes. But they didn't just make a compiler, they made uh, a compiler as a service. They made a compiler where all the parts of it are open and public and you can use them in your own code. Um, and it's brilliant. And uh, around the time of .NET, 3 point, .NET Core 3.1, Microsoft said, we're not supporting WCF in .NET Core um, or web forms. Or, or a couple of other things. Uh, if it's not in now, it's not coming at all. And WCF people went, hang on, what? What are we supposed to do? And Microsoft said, rewrite it to gRPC. And the WCF, that, that's, that sounds really complicated. And I thought, well, hang on, you've got, in WCF, you've got service contracts, and you've got data contracts, and you've got operation contracts. And those map pretty clearly to gRPC services and RPC methods and messages. And so if you analyze the C sharp code, which has got the WCF attributes on it, you should be able to generate the gRPC assets that you need. Um, and if, it, if Roslyn hadn't existed, and if step one of that had been write a C sharp parser, I would have gone, but that sounds really complicated. But Roslyn existed, and I went, I, I, that sounds like the kind of thing that Roslyn's good for. So that's why I picked it up and learned it. It's difficult to learn. The documentation is not great, hence this talk. So, how to Roslyn? <clears throat> A bunch of NuGet packages. Um, all under Microsoft.CodeAnalysis. So you've got Microsoft.CodeAnalysis.CSharp.Workspaces. And a workspace lets you load a solution and then you can work with the code. Um, we also have Microsoft.CodeAnalysis.Workspaces.MSBuild. And that uh, works at, a, uh, at the project level and gives you solutions and everything else. There's a weird little package called Microsoft.Build.Locator. I really don't understand what it does. I just know it exposes one method and you need to call that method first. Um, <laughs> and then there's also NuGet.ProjectModel, which is useful for analyzing package references and that sort of thing. So workspaces, this is the top level thing. Um, and we have uh, an ad hoc workspace. So you can create this in memory, and then you can create a solution, add that to it, create projects, add them to the solution. Uh, it's really good for unit tests and mucking about and just trying ideas out. And then you have the MS build workspace, which is the useful one. Uh, and you can actually call build on it, and it will generate DLLs and all that sort of thing. And then specifically when you're creating Visual Studio extensions, you have Visual Studio Workspace, which has got a bunch of extra stuff that lets you interact with Visual Studio itself. And the workspace looks like this. So you have a workspace, and you can load a solution into the workspace, and you have one active solution at a time. And then a solution has projects, and the projects have documents. So your C Sharp files are documents, and so are your XAML files, and your appsettings.json files, and everything else. Um, and so 
I'm going to switch over to, to code, which involves putting my glasses on because I am old and I can no longer, I got LASIK and now I can actually see uh, where the Apollo stuff was left on the moon, um, <laughs> but I can't read my screen. It's, it's a good trade-off. It's improved my tennis. <laughs> and you know, I'm not good at tennis, but I'm better than I was before I got LASIK. And that's what I tell my wife when she complains about me spending £4,000 on lasers. Um, so yes, here we go. This is, this is my demo program. Um, and this is, this is the thing you get from that, um, MS, that build locator. And you do this first, you do msbuildlocator.registerdefaults because your machine's got all kinds of MS builds all over the place. The .NET SDK has one, Visual Studio has one, all the other Visual Studios have one. So this somehow finds the right one. I don't know how it does it, it's magic. Okay, so then we create a workspace. We call msbuildworkspace.create and we set a, a Boolean to say, load the metadata for referenced projects. So we get um, all the NuGet packages and all those sorts of things, we get metadata loaded for them. We add an event handler to workspace failed. So when it loads the solution, it will actually build it. And any build errors will go out uh, to this event handler. And a lot of the time, uh, like if you have a .NET 6 project, and you're doing this sort of stuff, and you try and load a .NET Framework 4.7 project, it won't work um, because it can't run some of the target DLLs that are used by the main MS build. It's very frustrating, but that's the way it is. And then we just open a solution. We say workspace open solution async args zero. So now we have a solution loaded into our workspace. And we can go back to the slides and we do da 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 do. This is all just there for people to go, can we have the slides? Um, so, actually getting into the C sharp code, we use syntax trees. So, uh, when the C sharp compiler runs, it tokenizes the, the text um, and everything becomes a token. So, a semicolon is a token and an open brace is a token and a string literal is a token. And then it turns that into an abstract syntax tree. And a syntax tree, has syntax nodes in it. And so every bit of your code is represented by a syntax node, and that syntax node has lots of syntax nodes underneath it, and so on and so on, and the entire thing is represented. So you can sort of think of it like a, like a DOM or an XML document, but instead of elements, it's actually C-sharp code. And you can dig into all of that, and then the tokens are things like identifiers, variable names, uh, semicolons, white space, everything uh, is a syntax token within that tree. Um, oh no, hang on, white space is not a token, it's trivia. So trivia is stuff that it's there, it's important, <laughs> but in terms of layout and all that kind of thing, but the compiler doesn't care about it, the compiler is going to ignore it. And it's really kind of difficult at first to get your head around how that syntax tree relates to actual code and what the syntax type for like a method call is or a property declaration is. And so there's a super useful thing uh, built into Visual Studio if you've installed the code uh, analysis tools as part of your setup. Um, and you can go to other windows and syntax visualizer and this shows you on the right hand side a syntax tree eventually there we go and so this is your entire this is everything in this file so you can see we've got a using directive here that's that using directive that's an identifier token we've got the using keyword which is a token then an identifier name node and that's got an identifier token in it and so if you want to find out what a particular um, thing is then you can just click on it in your actual code and see what it's represented as in the syntax tree. This is how I learned how to use Roslyn syntax trees, was uh, clicking through WCF code on the left-hand side and just seeing what it was on the right-hand side. So, go away, don't need you. <coughs> so, how do we navigate through syntax? Well, there are two ways to do this. 
And the first one uh, is, or the simplest one uh, for most C Sharp programmers is the link API. Uh, so in the same way as you can use link to go through an X, X document or X element, and you've got dot elements and dot uh, attributes and all those sorts of things. You have exactly the same kind of thing in Roslyn. And so we can say node dot descendant nodes, which will get all the nodes below that, not child nodes. Child nodes just gets the next level down. Descendant nodes gets everything below that in the tree. And then if we want to find, say, class declarations, then we can say of type class declaration syntax. And we get back an I enumerable of all the syntax nodes which are declaring a class. If we want to go back up the syntax tree, then we can use first ancestor or self. So if I want to find what namespace this class is in, I can say first ancestor or self namespace declaration syntax, and it will navigate up the tree until it finds uh, a syntax of that type. And it's super easy. So I'll show you how that looks in here. We have a syntax query demo dot list async. So if I navigate to that, we got our solution here, um, and we say for each document in solution.projects.select many p documents, uh, get the syntax root from the document. If root is null, that means it's not a syntax document. So it might be appsettings.json or, uh, or just a, a static image or whatever it is. So we'll get that null if there's no C sharp for us to read um, or VB. And then, really nice thing is that it gives you back the same stuff regardless of whether it's C Sharp or VB code. And very early on, one of the demos was, um, I'm going to copy this chunk of VB code, and then using Roslyn, I'm going to paste it over here as C Sharp code. And I really don't understand why everybody in the world hasn't done that already. I'm going to write a, a, a Trojan that infects people's computers, and any time it signs vb.net code, it's going to rewrite it as C sharp, and then <laughs> charge them a Bitcoin ransom to turn it back. <laughs> I either pay me five thousand dollars in Bitcoin, or just learn C sharp and get on with it. <clears throat> I didn't say it was going to be completely serious. You know, it's 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 still me. I'm still stupid. Um, so yes, but no, we can go through here and uh, you know, class declaration syntax and interface declaration syntax, they have a base type, which is a base type declaration syntax. And so we can say find uh, in all the nodes in this document, find type declaration syntaxes, and then we can get the namespace by doing this first ancestor or self, and then we can put those two things together and we can just write out the namespace and the type name. And so if I run this, and hope it can find the solution it's looking for. Are you finding it? There we go. It took it a while, but it got there. So this, this solution contains a class called program, sample.program, and there's a library project which contains a class called sample.library.greeter. That was exciting, wasn't it? OK. So you can go through all your code and just write these queries, these link queries, um, and actually that's a, that's a very useful way of like searching through an entire solution looking for interesting things. But if you actually have a node, you actually have a, a document and you're looking for specific things in that document, say method declarations, and you want to make sure that all the method declarations have got a public or a private or an internal or a protected, you know, nobody's just gone void main, um, then you can use uh, an alternative approach, which is called the syntax walker. And there's an important thing that you have to remember here that I forgot a couple of times uh, early on in my Roslyn journey. There is a C-sharp syntax visitor, and there is a C-sharp syntax walker. The C-sharp syntax visitor will get a thing, and then it will stop. 
So if you've got, a say, a method declaration, if you've got a class declaration and it's got another class declaration inside it, then the C-sharp syntax visitor won't find that nested declaration. It does it, it's kind of like the difference between child nodes and descendant nodes. C-sharp syntax walker will just go right through the entire tree and find all the types you're looking for. And so you inherit from this C-sharp syntax walker class and you just override the method for things you are interested in. So if I'm looking for a class declaration syntax, I just override visit class declaration. And so we go back to my demo and we comment that out and we uncomment that and head over to that definition. We have this list types walker here and we can just say walker.visit and pass in our syntax tree and that types walker just overrides visit class declaration and visit interface declaration because I don't care about structs and enums and records apparently but those are in there as well um, and then I can just write that out uh, the same as before so this is a different application but it's going to do exactly the same thing. And it's going to put it down there for some reason, and I don't know why, but it did. So yes, we still get the same output out of that. So we've now got, we got the syntax and we've got the identifiers and we can get the tokens out. And so um, if I see uh, like a call to logger.log information, um, I can sort of go, okay, so underscore logger is usually, but how do I know what type underscore logger is? And so I could write code to go and find where underscore logger is defined and where everywhere else where it's referenced and then see if it's passed in as a parameter to the constructor or is it being created with a new or, or something like that, which is just nobody wants to have to do all of that. And so this is where Roslyn gets really cool. It has this idea of semantic models. So you can say, okay, I've got my syntax tree. Give me what it means. Give me a model that tells me what everything in that syntax tree means. And that gives us something that looks a lot like doing reflection at runtime. So if you've got a type and you're doing, you do uh, object.getType, then you can do get methods and get properties and get fields. And the semantic model gives you the same kind of functionality, but it's doing it with code that's not running. It's doing it um, at design time. And so we can say uh, await project.getCompilation async, and then from the compilation, we can pass in the syntax tree that we're using, and we can say, give me the semantic model for this and tell me what all of it means. And then within that, we get symbols. So we had syntax nodes in the syntax tree. In the semantic model, we have symbols. And there's a, there's a method symbol and a named type symbol. Um, and these look like uh, a lot like method info and type info and those things that we get from reflection. So back here again. And let's close everything else. And we'll take that out and we'll go and look at list async. So for each project in solution.projects, get the compilation. Now the project might not be a compilable project. The project might be one of those weird random projects that doesn't have any C-sharp code in it. And if that's the case, then get compilation async will return null. And then we can say, go through the documents, get the syntax tree for the document. And then we can say get semantic model for that tree. So that gives us the semantic model for that entire file. And then we can go looping through our syntax with our descendant nodes of type base declaration syntax. And then we can go to the model and say, give me the declared symbol for this uh, type declaration syntax. And it will pass it back as an I named type symbol. And I named type symbol has got uh, a whole bunch of properties. Uh, so we've got member names and static constructors and tuple elements um, and all these sorts of things and containing namespace and attributes. Everything related to that um, is available on this uh, named type symbol. 
um, as immutable arrays a lot. There's a lot of immutability in uh, Roslyn, and we'll talk more about that later on. So if it's a named type symbol, then we can just say what type it is, which will be interface or class or struct or whatever. And then we can put system.containing namespace and symbol.name. And so this allows us to go, right, I've got iLogger, and that will give me back a symbol. Uh, and I can say that symbol is uh, a, a reference to something. And I can say, give me the type information for that symbol. And it'll come back and say that type is iLogger of something, or just iLogger, um, or something that implements iLogger. And so once I'm in there, I can say, uh, I've got my type kind and my containing namespace. But now I can say, give me all the members of that symbol of type method symbol. So give me the declared methods in that symbol. And the method symbol has a thing on there that says, is it implicitly declared? Because by the time we get here, a lot of the C-sharp compilation process is already run. So if you've got a property, the C-sharp compiler generates get and set methods and hides them. Uh, but they will show up here. Um, if you don't have an explicit constructor, it generates a default constructor for you, and that will show up here. So I don't, I don't want to see anything that's implicitly declared, and I can just write uh, method symbol dot name out here. And so if we run that, and it'll stay at the front this time. See now I've got a class which is sample program, and it's got a method main and a method ask name, and I've got a class which is sample library greeter, which has got a constructor. Uh, which just has that special name, .ctor, so it doesn't, um, uh, doesn't give you the, the sort of greeter name for it. And we have a greet method. Um, I should probably actually... Uh, let's... Uh, oh, for goodness sake. Show more options. Yes, Windows 11, two clicks are definitely better than one. Thanks for that. No, I don't trust the authors. I'm an idiot. Um, so yes, you can see here we've got sample. Here's program. Here's my main method. Here's my ask name method. Um, and you can see in sample library, we have greeter. And that it's not an implicit constructor, so it wasn't implicitly declared. And I have my greet method here. And the really great thing is Roslyn by the time I get to these symbols, I don't care whether you use the lambda syntax for a method or any of that sort of stuff. Um, I know what it's doing. I know what type it's returning. I know all that sort of good stuff. OK. So you can do a lot of quite powerful things with these symbols and syntax trees and, and all this sort of stuff. And there's quite a lot of stuff built into Roslyn that would be difficult to implement, but they've, they've done it for you. So for example, there is a dot rename method um, in there. And if you want to rename a type and then have that reflected all through the solution, you can just call dot rename and pass in the new name that you want to give it. And it will actually give you back a new solution where that symbol has been renamed and all references to it have been renamed as well. So it's like having code access to those cool refactorings that you have in Visual Studio itself. Um, and so one of the things we can do is find uh, references to types or all the types that are used by a, um, by a class. And so if we... Uh, there's a symbol visitor, but I'm not going to show it to you because um, it takes a lot of time. And personally, I've never, I don't use it for anything. I always, with symbols, I just do get members and, and this and that and the other. Um, but the code for this is on GitHub. Uh, and there's a link at the end. Um, and you can check out what the symbol visitor does. It's sim similar to syntax visitor. Um, but it, uh, it works with symbols rather than syntax trees. Um, the other reason is the last time I did this talk, it took an extra 15 minutes. Um, so I've set a thing on my watch to go buzz. So we're just going to go straight to dependencies demo and list all used types. So we have a hash set of string because we only want to list each type once. 
and we say, for each project in this solution, get the compilation, uh, for each document in project.documents, and then, this is a fun one, uh, if you're running over, um, let's say, a WPF solution, uh, you have XAML files in your WPF solution, but somewhere hiding in the OBJ folder is, if you've got a, a user control called um, My Flashy Button, uh, then you've got a My Flashy Button dot XAML somewhere hiding in your project. There's a My Flashy Button dot xaml.g.cs, which is the C-sharp code that's been generated from that XAML. Same thing with Razor um, pages in Blazor projects and things like that. It, there's some hidden code being generated. And now, particularly, we've got source generators doing stuff. You've got uh, to deal with this idea, because we don't want to be refactoring or rewriting or raising alerts because code that's been generated by Visual Studio or something has done weird things. So this does its very best to work out if the file is auto-generated. So we get the file name without the extension, the last extension, because we're assuming that's going to be .cs. Um, and then these are the patterns that I have found. We've got temporary generated file. .designer, uh, that will hide any uh, Windows Forms sort of automatically maintained files. Um, dot generated gets in there a lot. Dot G hides all your XAML CS files. Dot GI, I can't remember, but I must have found it because it's in there. Um, and then we also have begins with auto generated comment. And this shows actually doing some, some code intelligence stuff. So we can say uh, get the leading trivia for this document. So get everything before uh, an actual C-sharp syntax uh, token, which is usually using or possibly namespace. So the leading trivia, if there's comments at the top of the code, it will pick all of those up. And we can say where uh, the kind is multi-line comment trivia or single line comment trivia. And then we can go through those and we can say get the text of that comment, whatever it might be, and then just look to see if it contains the word auto-generated, either hyphened or not hyphened, um, because there's no standard for this. Uh, and yeah, and it doesn't pick up some things, because quite a lot of the time the comment says, this code was generated by a tool, um, which to be fair would also be true of code that um, some people I've worked with have written. Okay, so if it's auto-generated, ignore it. Otherwise, get the syntax tree. So notice that auto-generated just worked on the file name. So we're trying to be as efficient as possible here. Because then if, it's, if we think it's not auto-generated, but it still might be, we have to get the syntax tree, which takes like a few milliseconds. Um, if that's null, then we just carry on. Otherwise, we get the semantic model. Uh, we get the uh, syntax node, those should probably be in the other order. That's, that's unnecessary. So yeah, there we go. Get the, get the syntax root of the document. That get root async returns the top level syntax uh, node. And then we can say, does it begin with an auto-generated comment? And if it does, then we'll just continue round. Otherwise, we'll just say get the semantic model, and then we have this get types item here and we pass in our syntax node and our semantic model. And so we say named types, we're gonna go through and we're gonna look for identify a name syntax, uh, which is gonna be variables, fields, properties, that sort of thing. And we can look for expressions as well, because in C-sharp, all expressions have a type. Um, and so like uh, x equals x plus one, if x is an integer, that whole expression has a type of integer. And so we can say, or if you're calling a method, then that has a return type. And so that expression has a type there as well. Um, even if that return type is void, or system.void, as it's actually called. And so in here, we can say, get the named types and find the uh, named type symbols for those. 
get for the identifiers and do the same thing with the expressions. Uh, find all the things which are a named type, because some of these things are not a named type, some of them might be an error type, because the compiler doesn't actually know what they are at the moment, but the syntax tree still has to work, even if your code's broken. Um, and there's also just other iType symbol implementations that are things that are not named types. They're, they're sort of magic, and they're hidden, and don't touch them. And then we can just concatenate those together, um, and I should be using symbol equality comparer when comparing symbols. That's incredibly meta. That's the Roslyn analyzer analyzer telling me that I've written my Roslyn analyzer wrong um, and probably offering me a code. There you go. Uh, introduce. Per no, I'm not going to do that. Um, but yes. And then I can push that back up there and then we get typeset dot order by. So uh, we do for each name type symbol, and then we just add the uh, containing namespace and name type symbol dot name. Um, interesting point about containing namespace: uh, if you, there, it has a dot name property on it. Um, so if you are in, say, system dot link, then symbol dot containing namespace dot name will be link and it will have a containing namespace, which is system, and then that will have a containing namespace, which is the global namespace. Uh, but if you call to string on containing namespace, it turns it into system.link, so, which is essentially what we're doing here with string interpolation. So if I run this, we can see that these are all the types that are used by anything in this program. So it uses my type, obviously, sample.library.greeter. Um, it's not actually using program anywhere. Uh, there's no references to program in any expressions or identifiers, so it doesn't show that one up. But we are using boolean and char and console and int32 and string and void, system.void, which is not available to us as a type. Um, it is available to F-sharp programmers because they have unit, which is basically the same thing. But uh, everything has a type, even if that type is void. OK. Then it gets really fun. So this is the point where it's actually starting to do something useful, is when you can rewrite the code. And it is incredibly straightforward. Once you get your head around all of this and you've learned what the different syntax node types are called and the different symbols are called and you've got used to this idea of spelunking through your code in a console application, um, then you can start to rewrite that code. You can start to make tweaks to it. But remember I said all those things in syntax nodes and, and symbols, they're all immutable arrays. So there is a system.collections.immutable NuGet package, which was basically created. I've got Mads Torgerson in the room, by the way. So I'm teaching you about Roslyn, and the guy is, yeah, it's, it's a little bit unnerving. Oh, cool. OK. I'm, I'm just waiting for him to be looking at me go. <laughs> but yeah, I think we're doing all right. So. Um, System.collections.immutable was actually created for the Roslyn project because the thing is you've got your, your model of your program in memory and if two things change that at the same time, that's bad. But what you don't want is a crap load of locks or semaphores all over the place to stop two things because A, that's going to slow things down and B, if you say you should lock something before you modify it, you're relying on programmers to actually do that. And yeah, <laughs> just no. So everything's immutable. Um, what things in Roslyn are immutable? Well, everything. Uh, solutions are immutable. Projects are immutable. Documents, syntax nodes, everything from top to bottom. The only thing that is not immutable is workspace. OK, so if you add one letter to one line in one syntax node, in one document, in one project, what you get is a new solution because it's immutable. And then that becomes the active solution. 
So every time you change something, it's rebuilt. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of reuse going in there. They're not literally recreating the entire tree every time you do something. But uh, making a change to a syntax node um, affects the solution at the top level. And then you go back to the workspace and you say, apply the changes from this solution, and then that becomes the current solution. And that makes it really difficult, because if you think about it, OK, let's say um, I just want to uh, call to upper on any string literals anywhere in my application. That's fun. We can do that. Uh, so um, I, get my, I go to my document, and I say, hey, document, give me all the string literals in your syntax tree. And it says, OK, here you go. And so I change the first one, and I add two upper to it. And now the whole of the rest of the tree that that node is contained in has become invalidated. The document is invalidated because I made a change. And so I need to kind of go th and I do it, and then I apply that. And then I start for reaching through again and remember which ones I've already done and then add the next one. It would be horrible. And so there is a C-sharp syntax rewriter, which looks just like the C-sharp syntax walker or visitor, except instead of void, every method returns a syntax note. And so that looks like this. So upshift all strings. We go through, we ignore auto-generated comments. Um, we also ignore, um, so one of the auto-generated files is in .NET Core and .NET 5, .NET 6 projects is assemblyinfo.cs. Uh, because we don't put that in anymore. It's auto-generated for us from the CS proj file. And assembly info doesn't like it if you upshift your assembly description or assembly company name. So we, that's why we keep those out like that. And then uh, we have our model. We get our semantic model for this document. Um, for some reason, we're not checking to see whether that's null, but never mind. And then we just create a string literal upshifter, and we pass in our semantic model. And then we say visit and pass in our syntax root here. And then if we go and look in here, we can see we just override visit literal expression. And so any literal expression syntax that we get in here uh, will, be, will trigger this method. And we can say, uh, is it an iNamed type symbol? And if the type is string, and then we could say, uh, is it system.string? And assume that it's got uh, two upper invariant. But actually, it's just as much fun to say, look at its members and see if it's got a two upper invariant member on it. And then we'll just call that anyway. Because if some idiots come along and created their own string, because Microsoft's string is rubbish and they know how to string better than Microsoft, I'm literally working on code written by somebody who thought that about himself. It's, everything is, is wrapped in his weird variants. And so I go, this is a string. It has a two upper invariant method. And so I'm going to add a call to dot two upper invariant to this string here. Um, and so I need to return a new syntax node here. And so I can return syntax factory. So when you want to generate code, you use syntax factory. That allows you to create any kind of C-sharp syntax. The other thing you can do is just pass it a string and say syntax factory .pass, which is often a lot more straightforward, believe me. Um, but I'm going to create an invocation expression, uh, which is going to use a member access expression of this node here, so this literal. We're going to access a member on that literal, and we're going to pass in the identifier name of string dot two upper invariant. So we're going to create a member access expression that accesses a member to upper invariant on that node. And we just return that back out. So when this finishes, uh, the top level syntax node that we've passed into visit will have had any string literals. They'll have had the two upper invariant appended onto them. If uh, we don't match any of these things here, 
then we return base.visit literal expression. It's always a good idea with these Roslyn things to call the base method. A lot of the time, if you don't call the base method, it will stop walking. And uh, you can have strings inside strings now, thanks to string interpolation. You can have a, a string which is an interpolation string, and then inside that, you can have a string literal. It's quite often you have sort of a Boolean, and you say, if this, then that string, otherwise that string, or, or something. So you need to dig down into uh, string literals to see if there are any more string literals hiding inside them. This is one of those things where I kind of go, that's complicated. Imagine having to write that. Imagine having to write this. Comp I cannot begin to imagine um, how you go about writing one of these things. Super clever people at work. Okay, so then that comes back to here, um, and we say visit, and we get a new root out of that. So that's the top level syntax node with any of those rewrites, those changes made all the way through it. Um, and we just have a new top level node now. And then we can call is equivalent to. And so we say new root dot is equivalent to root. Is it semantically the same document? You could strip all the white space out and it would be semantically the same document. Um, so we use this is equivalent to to say have we actually changed anything? And if we have, let's count how many things we've changed. And we'll say solution equals new solution with document syntax root. So every document, every project, every solution has an ID, which is actually a GUID, but it's wrapped in a document ID struct. Um, and we say, so create a new solution, and this document should now have this syntax root. So it automatically handles the thing about the project, so it creates a new document with that syntax root and a new project with that document and a new solution with that project that's been changed, and it throws away the old ones because they're immutable. And then we store that in here, and we keep going through, and we keep going through, and then down at the end here, we just say uh, if new solution and workspace.current solution are not the same, then workspace.tryapply changes. I'm not doing anything uh, with the return of that, but try apply changes returns Boolean. And so if your new solution contains changes, but somebody else has changed current solution in the meantime, this is like doing a git merge. It's like a conflict thing. So if something else has changed workspace.current solution in the meantime, then no, you can't do this start again with current solution and go back and try again. So I could put something like, if not workspace.tryapply changes, go to um, here. And I'm not afraid of go to's. There you go, there's a label. And we can say, if not workspace.tryapply. Screw you, Dijkstra. <laughs> I love GoTo. Um, I, I, GoTo is, is much maligned, and, and I don't appreciate it. Um, I write quite a lot of methods which are try, and they return Boolean, and they have an out parameter. Um, and you try three or four things along the way to doing it. You're going, can I do this? OK, I did that. And, and if at any point any of those fail, you have to set that parameter default and return false. So you've got two operations. And so you can either say, if I can't do this, thing equals default, return false. If I can't do this, thing equals default, return false. Or you can nest your ifs and go, if this, if that, if that, if that, value equals this, return true, and then do it. Or you can put thing equals default, return false down at the bottom with an abort label, and then in all your ifs, you just do go to abort, go to abort, go to abort. So yeah, I like go to. Also, I'm just contrary. Um, so uh, we've got our sample here. We've got a string literal in here. It says, hello, name. Um, have we got a string literal in here? We've got what's, oh, hang on. We'll take that to upper invariant off there. So that is now back to where it should be. And if we run this, uh, 
one change is applied, and then if I go back to code here, it's not in there because it's probably, what's my debug set to? Solution Explorer. Uh, properties. Debug. Oh, good Lord. They changed everything. Oh, okay, there we go. Copenhagen. All right, cool. <laughs> yes, right, 15 minutes, and we're just about to move to the analyzer, which is the really good bit. So let's run this again against the right code. And we see one change is applied. And if we go back to here, two upper invariant has magically appeared on there. What you will notice is that it has not appeared on here because this is not a string literal. It is an interpolated string expression, and it's a different thing. And so if I wanted to catch that, I would have to add an override for that in my syntax rewriter as well. So yes, uh, you can do syntax node.replace node, and for very quick fixes, and we will actually see this in a moment, um, that is uh, a, a valid way of doing things. But if you think you're going to do multiple replacements on a single node, then C Sharp Syntax Rewriter is your friend. Remember to call base. Um, syntax Factory for generating code. Just type syntax factory dot and marvel at the many different kinds of syntax that there are, and then use pass and just pass in some code in a string. Um, and then solution dot with document syntax root creates a new copy of the solution and then workspace, workspace dot try apply changes. And if that returns false, you have to use a go to. No, not, not allowed to do anything else. You have to use a go to. Okay. So the point at which this actually becomes useful for most people is analyzers. Roslyn analyzers are fantastic. And there are uh, two things that I really, really like about them. And one is that uh, they do a lot of the hard work for you. And you just tell the analyzer what kind of things you're interested in. And then it just calls you and says, hey, I've got one of these. Is it OK? And you can say, yes, it is. Or you can return some diagnostics and say there's a problem with it. But you can also create a code fix for it that magically fixes whatever it is. And the other thing I really like about them is the deployment model. So you can create a Visual Studio extension uh, with your analyzer or analyzers in it. And then people can download that from the Visual Studio Marketplace. Um, and so, you know, these days, Code Rush from DevExpress, that's pretty much what that is. It's a bunch of Roslyn analyzers. ReSharper still use their code engine of their own um, because, you know, they've got it and why not carry on using it? The other place you can put it is in a NuGet package. And so if you put out a NuGet package, an XUnit is a good example of this. So when you install XUnit, it brings some analyzers with it. And then if you do, uh, if you create a, a test method and you put theory attribute on it and you put an inline data attribute on it and your method takes two parameters, but your inline data attribute doesn't have two parameters, you'll get squiggles saying that's not going to work. Your inline data doesn't match your theory. And this is distributed so you don't have to install an extension in Visual Studio to do this. Uh, you can just ship it with your NuGet package, and it has the fix in there if it's possible to, to intelligently fix it. So we're just going to create a very simple logger usage analyzer, iLogger. So everybody uses iLogger in your .NET uh, core MVC applications, all that sort of thing. And you just go underscore logger dot log information bar, which you shouldn't. That's not right. That's bad. What you should do is if underscore logger dot is enabled log lever dot information, then underscore logger dot log information bar. But programmers are lazy. <laughs> and so we don't. And so we just make that log information call. And then inside there, it says, yeah, don't, don't do that and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, and quite a lot of the time, 
in that log thing, we might be calling another method, we might be accessing a property, we're doing things. It's a non-zero effort to call that logger. And particularly if you've got like underscore logger dot log debug, that's almost certainly not turned on in production, but it's still taking up CPU cycles. So if you look at the code inside Kestrel, for example, where they're trying to squeeze every last request per second, all the loggers calls are guarded with if underscore logger dot is enabled. What would be really nice is if we could find this and automatically replace it with this. So, 10 minutes to go. I'm not going to write it live, but um, I was saying to Mads at lunchtime, uh, the version last time I did this was for Visual Studio 2019. Now on 2022, it doesn't work. And so I thought, I'll, I'll just write it again from scratch in 2022. It took me one hour to write this. Um, and obviously, you know, I know Roslyn and I've done a lot of stuff with it, but. So we create, um, in the Visual Studio project templates, you will find analyzer with code fix. And that will generate you um, essentially a bunch of projects. And in that project, you will have your logger fix and your logger fix .code fixes. Logger fix is the name I gave the project. Um, we have a package here, which is when you want to bundle it as a NuGet package and distribute it. Uh, it generates tests for us, which I haven't done anything with. And we have a VSIX if you want to bundle it up and package it and ship it to the Visual Studio Marketplace. Um, or if you want to write a joke extension, and then when your friend goes away and leaves his machine unlocked, you sneak on and you copy the VSIX package on, and then weird things start happening in his code, and he doesn't know why. Just little red squiggles under every third line of code going, you're just a bad person. <laughs> Words just come out of my mouth. Anyway. So we have a diagnostic analyzer base class. That's how we implement our analyzer, and we're going to override things on there. So we give ourselves a diagnostic ID. We're just going to call ourselves logger fix. We have some localizable strings because we want to tell our friend he's a bad person in all the languages in the world um, using Google Translate. So we have our resources file so we can localize our, our messages and uh, menu items and things. So we have a title and a message format and a description. Uh, the category shouldn't be naming. The category should be um, writing proper code. Um, so yeah, uh, we have a uh, override supported diagnostics and we're going to return an immutable array of rule here. So our diagnostic descriptor, this is our rule that our analyzer is checking for, which has got our ID and our title and our message format and our category. Um, if I was actually doing this, I would try and figure out what the category should be because there are some pre-named ones. Um, so that's our supported diagnostic. So we can basically say, if you have anything that matches this diagnostic, then uh, call us. We have this initialize, which gives us the analysis context. Um, and that uh, allows us to register our operation in there. Uh, we're going to register analyze operation here. And the things that we are operating on is invocations, because underscore logger dot log something is a method invocation. And then we have our analyze operation here. And we go, OK, so this is passing in um, essentially semantic model things at this point. And so we have our context operation. That's just I operation. We want to say, is it an invocation operation? Is it, are we invoking a method? And if we are, then we can say, OK, is the target method a log method? And so we can say here, um, log methods dot contains, so log methods is up here, log critical debug, error, information, trace, and warning. I'm not dealing with the dot log, open brackets, log level dot information, because A, it's really complicated, uh, and B, who uses that? Hands up who uses that. Good. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, is log just goes, um, does log methods contain that name? And then, is it iLogger? And then down here, so we pass in the type that the method is being invoked on. 
and it's either going to be iLogger, but actually it's not. It's an extension method. It's uh, in a, a type called logging extensions. Um, and so we have logger extensions, sorry, here. And then we say, is it Microsoft.extensions.logging? And we go, OK, so is the namespace logging? And is that contained in the extensions namespace? And is that contained in the Microsoft namespace? And is that in the global namespace? If all that is true, then this is definitely Microsoft's log information or log debug method. And then we can say, is it guarded? We can go looking to say, is this invocation guarded? So we say, go, um, oh, this is a fun for loop. Um, if you've never written a for loop that wasn't just for i equals thing, i is less than thing, uh, welcome to possibly hell, I don't know. So for this is how you loop back up things in a tree. You say, for var parent, um, and then you say it's not a method or property declaration. If we get to a method or property declaration, there aren't going to be any if statements outside of that, so we don't care. Um, and then at the end here, we can say parent equals parent dot parent. Um, I get in so much trouble at work for writing for loops like that. But it's perfectly legitimate. And then I do go tos to jump out of them. <laughs> okay, so. We're at the parent of our log method now, and we go, is it an if statement? If it isn't an if statement, then it's definitely not an if logger dot is enabled, so we can just carry on. And then we can go back into this parent here, and we can find invocation expression syntax. This isn't quite right. There would be a little bit more to it than this. Um, and we can say, uh, get the operation here, which is an invocation, and then we can say target method name is enabled, return true. So actually what I would also need to do here is check that that's being called on the logger type and, and all this sort of thing. Like I say, it only took me an hour. Um, <clears throat> and so yeah, then uh, if it is already guarded, we can just return early. Otherwise, we create a diagnostic. We tell it where we're talking about, saying there's a problem. We tell it the rule that it's broken, and we pass in the invocation target method dot name, and that will be used to format a message, and then we can report this diagnostic. And so if I run this now, it'll spin up a new Visual Studio instance with this analyzer active. And we can open up worker sample here. This does take a minute because it's a laptop. I need a big ass workstation with like 64 cores or something. Because I am also running Slack, so you know. <laughs> it gets such a bad rap and it totally deserves it. Right, so here we have an unguarded call. Give Visual Studio a minute to catch up and actually generate the model in memory and, and pass the syntax and all this sort of stuff. Um, and eventually, we should get some squiggles that appear under here. So you can sort of tell it's getting there. There we go. We have a green squiggle underscore logger dot log information. And if I mouse over that, uh, logger fix. Log call log information is not guarded with is enabled. And it also shows up as a warning in my project compilation down here. And it would also show up as a warning. Um, so if this was a NuGet package included in the project, it would then also show up as a warning in the CI builds, um, which is another reason for doing it in NuGet packages. Um, and so the other thing that we have in the analyzer, I'm not going to stop the other thing running, is we have a code fix provider. And so go away. Go away. Um, and so in here, this is the thing that fixes the problem. Um, and we have this register code fixes async. And we say, uh, we uh, work with um, declarations of expression statement syntax. So what we want is the whole underscore logger. The invocation syntax isn't the whole line. The whole line is underscore logger dot log information, whatever the arguments are, semicolon. We want all of that. So we're going to register a code fix for that. 
and we say, here is our create changed solution. And you can see here, and every time you press control dot or alt enter and apply a code fix in Visual Studio, the method that is being called returns a new solution. And then Visual Studio sets that as the current solution every time. And so we do this add is enabled guard async and we return a whole new solution down here. So we say document get semantic model async. The level, well, the operation target method is log whatever. And so the level is the substring of that starting at the fourth character. So sort of third when you're zero based. Um, then we find the member access expression. So that is the, um, the, is uh, the, the underscore log level. That, that's the um, invocation thing there, the member access expression. It's the syntax node equivalent of our operation that we've got up here. So that's the semantic model. This is the syntax node. Um, and then we can get the leading trivia off there and we can create a new is enabled syntax. And remember I said pass expression. So, yep, we just syntax factory dot pass expression source dot is enabled log level level. Um, and then we use syntax factory to wrap that in an if statement. Uh, and that is constructed by passing in an if keyword and an open paren token. And then our is enabled expression here. And then a close paren token with trailing trivia, and then we'll put a new line in there, that's white space. Then we add the original expression and we put four spaces on the start of it, because I don't care what your indentation standards are. I'm putting in four spaces, deal with it. Um, and then uh, we don't have an else, because we could have an else there as well. And we put back the leading trivia that we got from the original expression. Okay, easy. Um, now we do original solution is document.project.solution. We get the syntax root from our document. Uh, we do syntax root.replace node and we replace our expression node here. So we don't need a visitor in this case. We're just replacing one node and we replace that with our if statement. And then we return the original solution with this new document syntax root and that is our code fix. And so if in here I press control dot, it and say add is enabled guard, then I get my is enabled goes in there and uh, the code is indented and the squiggle has gone away because now things are being done properly. And that is how you write a Roslyn analyzer. See, easy. <laughs> it is, it is, it's easy, it's honestly. Um, the first one will take you like a few hours and then the second one, you'll copy and paste most of the code from the first one, um, and it will <laughs> it'll go much quicker. Once you get past that kind of initial, I need to get my head around this, and I hope I've helped you with that to a certain extent, and certainly shown you how easy it is. And if you're sitting here thinking, it's really complicated, like I say, imagine actually writing a C-sharp parser from scratch. So. You have a diagnostic analyzer which makes the squiggles and your code fix provider that fixes the squiggles. It takes care of all the loading, the solution and all that sort of stuff for you. Here are some useful um, resources. So Josh Varty, when I was learning this stuff originally, he wrote a series of blog posts. They are fantastic. Um, they're slightly out of date. They don't have all the latest C-sharp stuff, but it's the fundamentals. It's the basics, and it's still pretty valid. Um, on github.com slash .net analyzers, it's an organization, and there's a bunch of real-world examples on there that you can uh, steal from. Um, and if you're interested in a thing that automatically migrates WCF to gRPC, then check out Visual Recode, um, because that's what it tries to do. That's it. Thank you very much. A couple minutes over, but cheers. <laughs>